This is the legend of a man named Sebastian. Sebastian grew up in Aurora, Ontario, Canada. He would find great joy in playing guitar, and since his adolescence, he would play in bands across the city. He would also find great joy in the simplicity of school. This joy would translate into inspiration, particularly through a teacher who quoted Hannah Arendt, quote, Education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it, and by the same token, save it from that ruin which, except for renewal, except for the coming of the new and the young, would be inevitable." End quote. This quotation inspired Sebastian to pursue a career in teaching. Through the years, Sebastian himself would sit in the teacher's chair and would educate hundreds of students over the years to be their best and to think differently, especially in the area of history. Sebastian was happy. And then one day, a single question would change Sebastian's life. This question would be one that he would always remember. On this particular day, Sebastian was teaching about the assassination story of Rasputin. Being an incredible story, Sebastian was understandably carried away with telling the story. Upon telling the story, one of his students asked a question. Did Rasputin's story really happen the way it did? Sebastian was stunned, yet also impressed. He came to find that although he told the accepted version of Rasputin's assassination, this version was not necessarily validated. Inspired by this, Sebastian set out to create his own distinctive method of telling history, or rather, retelling history. This method would be his own podcast called Our Fake History. The prime directive of Our Fake History to look at the many myths and misconceptions that complicate one's understanding of history, and to debunk such myths and misconceptions. Since his very first episode, Sebastian has educated hundreds of thousands of people around the world about fascinating historical facts, and he has become the master of history myth-busting. His podcast would win awards for its fun, educational content and he would even interview wrestlers about the history of wrestling itself. No matter the time period or subject area, Sebastian has mastered the art of education. For years, Sebastian has told history, but now it is time to tell his story. This is the legend of Sebastian Major. Sebastian, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you. Thanks for that very uh, epic sounding introduction. Thank you. That was, uh, <laughs> that was that was nice. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. So let's go all the way back to the very, very beginning. What inspired you to pursue teaching? Well, um, there was a lot of things. So... Um, I had done my undergraduate in uh, a really cool program here in Ottawa at Carleton University uh, called the College of Humanities. It was a Bachelor of Humanities was the, technically the, the degree. And uh, the whole idea of that program was it was a small uh, group of students that had a core lecture every year that tied in all the different uh, social sciences and like classic liberal arts into like one sort of cohesive uh, set of ideas uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. And so you would take, you know, courses in English literature and in history and in philosophy and all the sort of classic liberal arts. And then you had this core lecture that was uh, taught by two professors every year that would try and like bring all the ideas to together. Right. So whatever was sort of happening is happening historically in the moment you're discussing here's all the literature that was happening around it here's all the philosophy that was happening around it here is you know what was happening in in the sort of religion that the people were following so i i that was sort of my my university education and i i love that but that doesn't necessarily like immediately suggest a career <laughs> right so you know once you've done a program like that you really have to be 
creative about, you know, what you're going to do with it. And all I kind of knew I wanted to do was I wanted my work to feel like it was uh, contributing more than it was taking. And I know that sounds like just horribly pathetically idealistic, (laughs) but that's the truth. I might be a pathetically idealistic person. Um, but I, I really believe that I'm like, I I feel like I've got to do something where what I'm doing is giving more to the world than it's taking from the world. And it took me a minute to come to teaching as what that would be. Um, I ended up doing my master's in something called public history, which, you know, I use that degree every day now in, in what I do with the podcast, but that, and actually the humanities degree as well is, is a big part of what I do in the podcast. But, um, in public history, the whole uh, the, the thing that you are studying is how we communicate history to a public audience. And so that means like, how do we design the statues that we put up in public places and what story do those statues tell about the figure they're they're depicting? Uh, how do we design museum exhibits uh, to communicate history to visitors to a museum? How do we design a history curriculum in classrooms? Uh, you know, even like the writing of historical plaques, like how should that go? So that's, you know, what you're sort of learning to do in public history. But then you're also discussing the debates in public history, which are like, which statues do we keep up and which ones do we tear down? Right. So when I first got into public history, I mean, I thought it was incredibly niche and, and you know, most people thought it was kind of boring. But now we've lived through a time when like the most intense debates of our time have been kind of public history debates, like all those questions about which uh, which statues we should tear down. Uh, that's a public history question. And so that's the kind of stuff that I that I studied. Uh, but that set me up to work in either a museum uh, or in the archives. Uh, and a couple other things, but those were sort of the, a lot of the people that were in my program, uh, because I did it here in Ottawa, uh, went on to work in one of the big museums in the city. So it's capital of Canada for those listening who might not know, uh, Canada's capital and, you know, has a lot of museums per capita because of that. Uh, so there's a lot of museum jobs here, uh, but then also the National Archives of Canada is here as well. Right. So there's a ton of archivist jobs uh, in the city as well. So those were kind of careers that I could have kind of headed into. And I even had an internship at one of the big museums uh, here in the city, you know, right out of university. And for a minute, I thought maybe that was it. Like I was going to be a museum guy. I was going to be, you know, on the path to eventually, you know, hopefully becoming a curator. Um, And that probably would have taken more education and it would have been a completely different path. But I didn't like my job as a museum intern and I don't think I was a very good museum intern I because I, I wasn't particularly inspired. I was basically just reading books for a curator and summarizing books for him. I was like basically his like research assistant. And I, I don't think I was particularly good. I just wasn't motivated in that job. And the thing that I found that I missed was engaging with history and talking about it and and I, I I love the the social side of it. And also, I just miss being around people. And, you know, I, I spent, you know, my younger years uh, as a camp counselor and, you know, uh, yeah, I, I instructed all sorts. I've coached a bunch of sports. I, I was around young people and I missed that. And so um, it was after that year as an intern at the museum that I was like, I can't do this. I need to go back and get my teaching credentials and uh, become a teacher. And that's what I pursued for 11 years. I was a teacher until yeah. the podcast became my full-time job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that, 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 that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I'm glad you mentioned about Ottawa because Ottawa seems to be that place where if you wanted to pursue anything humanities related or social sciences related or well, political or yeah. law related, Ottawa is the place to be if you're in Canada. It's a good place to do it. I mean, Ottawa is, uh, I've just moved back here. I've now been a resident of Ottawa for a year. I'd been living in Toronto um, for you know 12 years before that. Um, and I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto, but uh, I came back with my, you know, now I've got my wife and two kids. It's a lovely place to raise a family. But Ottawa is kind of a small town. 
I mean, technically, it's got a population of a million people if you count all the suburbs. But, you know, really, you know, Ottawa has the vibe of a a town where you kind of know everyone, except it's the capital city of Canada. So it has to dress itself up as a big city. Right. Because we have like, you know, the president of the United States visits, you know, like stuff like that happens in town. And so, you know, there's like what's wonderful about that is that it punches above its weight in terms of like, you know, culture that's going on here. You know, there's a ballet like my wife goes to the ballet semi regularly with her mom, um, which, you know, most cities that size wouldn't have that. But Ottawa does because it's the capital city. Right. Um, and the mu- again, the number of museums per capita is wild. There's, and they're great museums. They're some of the best museums in the country because here we are in the capital city. Like, I mean, when people come and visit the capital city, that's the kind of thing they go and do. So if you were pursuing a career in museums, there aren't too many better places to do it. Now, that's not to say there aren't like great, you know, museums in in Toronto, in I mean, Winnipeg has like some of the best museums actually in Canada. Um, just just shouting out Canadian museums now, I guess. But um, but yeah, no, it, it, it made sense. And the thing is, like when coming back here now, you know, I very quickly realized that everyone my age now that I'm, you know, almost 40 everyone my age works for the government in some respect or the vast majority of people work for the government in some respect. And so I am now like a real outlier in the city of Ottawa. When people ask what you do, normally they expect you to say the ministry that you work for. And, and I am now, I'm like a a creative living and working in Ottawa, which makes me part of a very small community in this city. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I feel that too. I mean, in general, I mean, you and I both being podcasters for a number of years, in general, that's almost sort of like the outlier in so many different areas and career paths as well. It's funny because whether one is pursuing this like as a full-time thing or as a hobby or somewhere in between, it's that opportunity to be creative that offers a lot of different ways into approaching a different matter. And in your case, it's it's history. Mm-hmm. And it's so many different areas of history a- as well. So, I mean, th- it's it's all it's oftentimes the ones who are the outliers who usually set the tone for the non outliers, uh, <laughs> so to speak. Sure, <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. And in in your situation, in your case, still during the days of when you were studying history and humanities, what were your favorite time periods and places of history, and why? Uh, you know what? I, it's still the stuff I like to go back to now on the podcast. Um, there are so many eras that I love. And and what I've learned doing the podcast is that you look deep enough at, at any time and place, you will find something interesting. Because, I mean, I think actually being passionate about history is being passionate about human beings and being passionate about just the story of humanity. And if you think that human beings are interesting, then you will find something kind of interesting in any time and place. And, you know, sometimes people like to rag on Canadian history as being, you know, somehow dry or boring. But I don't think that's true at all. I think that's just people don't have a deep enough familiarity with it uh, and haven't and haven't again remembered that, like, you know, Canadian history is world history. Right. If if you are if you are fascinated by, you know, the coming together of all sorts of weird historical forces, it happened here, too. Right. There are tales to be told. But anyway, sorry, I'm not, that's a little bit of a rabbit hole. Favorite times and places. The ones I like going back to a lot are that. Uh, the the kind of first contact era. So um, like the starting at the like late 1400s and through the 1500s, sometimes gets called the age of exploration. But those moments when uh, when really like the cultures of the world started meeting each other in a new way. Um, so, you know, I, and those are often that's it's a very chaotic period. There's a lot of tragedy that comes out of that period. It's the start of colonialism. Uh, there's, you know, there's just horrible, horrible things that happen because of that. But then there's also these moments where it's like it could have gone another way. And those are the moments moments that fascinate me when, you know, um, 
because so many encounters, especially between like indigenous people and Europeans were just like terrible. I'm, I'm always sort of amazed by the ones that were not terrible. (laughs) And, and so those moments kind of to me are like, Oh, that's like the glimmer of hope in it all. Like it didn't have to be as bad as it was. There was perhaps another way things could have unfolded. So I'm forever interested in that time period um, and not just, you know, in North America, like I, I'm really fascinated by that same time period in um, in in East Asia um, and like and, and like Polynesia and like the Polynesian islands. Um, so that time period, I, I'm always interested in. I love the late 1800s as well, which is like this moment when technology really starts exploding. But I love that kind of late 1800s, like you know, steam power era. Um, I just, I just also find the characters from that era really fun and fascinating. And like, I, I got really obsessed with the story of um, who invented the first airplane because it's actually kind of a controversy, believe it or not. Right. Uh, and depending on where in the world you're from, you may have been taught a different thing about who invented the first heavier than air aircraft. But when you get into the story, what you learn about are all of these figures who are super into ballooning. And I just kind of love that era, the era of ballooning. And man, so I uh, the, the, there was one figure who I really became obsessed with. Uh, his name was Alberto Santos Dumont, and he was a, a Brazilian, Brazilian inventor who uh, lived in Paris, uh, like turn of the century. And he became famous as this pioneer for dirigibles, small balloons. Uh, And he had this idea. He was the first person who was able to successfully create a balloon that was navigable enough that he could fly it around the Eiffel Tower. So that was like a big thing at the time. Like, is your aircraft not just like something floating in the sky? Can you actually control where it goes? So he was able to create an aircraft that was like small enough and maneuverable enough that he could take it up and fly it around the Eiffel Tower and bring it back. And his story is just like amazing and wild. But he eventually developed this 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 personal dirigible, like a personal blimp. And he made one prototype and he would go bar hopping around Paris in his like personal blimp. And he had this like vision of the future that like, you know, in the future, everyone in the major cities around the world will have their own personal dirigible. And that's how we'll all get around. And I'm just like, that's like, I love that. I love that vision of the future that never came to pass. But I also love this guy who was like a partier. Like he was a drinker. He loved this Parisian nightlife. He would go out in his little dirigible and then he would, he would bring it down and he'd tie it off to a lamppost in Paris and then like shimmy down a ladder and then like go to his favorite favorites, like late night supper clubs and stuff and, and then get back in his dirigible and like fly it on home how could you not love that? Right? Like that's, that's, that's where I want to go in my imagination all the time. And it really happened, right? Like that, that's one that sounds like it should be a historical myth, but that's, that's something this guy really did. Um, And so I love going there in my mind. Um, I've always been a fan of, of, uh, you know, classical history. I love ancient Rome and ancient Greece. You know, I feel like a lot of people fall in love with that era. um, And I'm no different, (laughs) you know, uh, I I love going there uh, in my imagination and in my mind and reading the stories about the people there. And what's great about that era, and I know I'm giving you a long answer here, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> this is what we're doing. Um, but what I love about that era is that there's certain moments in Roman history when we get a lot of sources Um and that's rare for the ancient past, right? But in with Rome, there were a lot of writers. It was a fairly, fairly literate society with uh, a lot of people writing history and a history being written by a lot of different players. So in that era where, like, for instance, Caesar, when Caesar lived, the late Republic, we can see that era with like a real sharp focus because we get writing from 
a lot of the different people that lived through it. it. It's not just like a distant historian telling us about that time. We get that, but then we can compare that against the writings of guys like Cicero and Caesar himself uh, and Cato and a number of you know prominent figures from the time who left writing that survived, you know? And so that's cool because like that era like comes into such focus that it feels modern. It feels like very familiar. It doesn't feel like a two dimensional. There's so many parts of the past that can feel a little two dimensional just because the sources we have are aren't great. You know, that's just the, the, the nature of how we are kind of getting that that stuff communicated to us. But that era in the late Republic is like comes into a full 3d color and the the people feel like real people and people that you kind of know and and that's that i love that right i'm like oh like even though this is, is a story from over 2000 years ago th- these human beings seem so human they seem so human and that is a, you know actually very comforting even though I'm, it's a story about violence and like you know the, coups and 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 like you know death all over the place um i i i just i i i I, what i appreciate about it is is the the three-dimensional humanity of the people that we are able to kind of perceive there and you can't do that with every era of history even some eras that are more close are closer to us that for whatever reason the documentation wasn't there so you know people become more two-dimensional in the in the, in their recreation you know yeah yeah and, and that's another thing that also really attracts me to certain areas of history as well for me my favorite areas of history or eras of history are world war ii and cold war era sure because those ones are the parts where for me it's it, it, it's not the wars themselves that attract me to them but it's more of the fact that what happened then still affects us today we're still living in the after effects of that and recently i was also getting a lot more interested in republic era chinese history oh cool yeah which is an area of history that isn't well i mean in chinese circles it is talked about relatively commonly Mm -hmm. but it's not as commonly talked about outside of the chinese circles like in the western world yeah and it's it's fascinating because actually on on episode five of my podcast I was speaking with Doctor Tsang, and he even mentioned a lot of things I I had no idea about that area of history where it started out like the, the whole like the, the whole concept of the founding of modern China mm-hmm. was really only to drive out a specific ethnic group out of <laughs> out oh, of yeah. royalty. Well, it was the Manchurians, the Manchurians, was, right? Was, who were who were sort of a northern not ethnically han chinese right exactly yes. yeah 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 right. so course, they were course. they were they were the dominant well in terms of, of status they were the dominant ethnic group at the time because the Qing dynasty was the ruling dynasty the, the last ruling dynasty before they fell to to in 1911 so right. so and a lot of the rhetoric was originally you know drive out the manchurians but right. then afterwards quickly it was like Actually, we need to include the insurance, but just like drive out the, you know, whatever. You know. And then it became about more about political ideology than about uh, uh, ethnicity, I'm assuming. Yeah. Right? It became about, are you a nationalist? Are you a communist? Are you one of these other factions that's vying for supremacy in the mix here? Yeah. And it's also a little bit more complicated than that as well, because... <laughs> I mean, and and I guess what I mean, I'm still learning about it myself. So there could be some things that I could be getting wrong. And those of you in the audience who know more about it, please correct me in the comments of mm. of the YouTube video if you're watching the YouTube version of this, of course. But the 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 father of modern China, Doctor Sun Yat Sen, he, interestingly enough, he I would describe him personally as maybe the closest. Thing to a near perfect balance between like a Western ideal and a Chinese ideal, oddly enough. Interesting. Interesting. Because, be, okay, go ahead. <laughs> because in terms of politics and in terms of also cultural expressions, he was trying to go for like a mix between 
both the Western and the Chinese sides, right? You can even look at the mm. attire. Some some of them were starting to, to adopt a lot of Western attire, right? And of course, yeah. some also took on you know more traditional things. He, right. in terms of politics, I mean, he created the Republic of China, right? So it, right. it was it incorporating was to... like a Western political idea, you know? Yeah. Exactly. It was it was that was the goal, and then well, history happened. I won't comment on that part. <laughs> Things got yeah, pretty messy. No, no. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. I honestly, actually, today I got an email from a listener who was like, you know, I feel like I don't know enough about Chinese history. Could you please cover the Chinese Revolution? And I was like, whoa, like, I mean, it's it's I would love to because it's a fascinating and important topic that we want to talk about topics that have shaped our world that we're living in right now. There is one that I think in the West is deeply underreported on or under taught, you know, one we don't really know much about. Um, and I, I but I and I would love to. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of daunted by the size of that topic. Uh, cause also it's, you know, a, a minefield, right? Of, of contentious characters that many people still have very passionate feelings about, uh, that you have to like tread lightly on. So, you know, you don't just, you don't just wander into a conversation about Mao Zedong, you know, like exactly. you, you got, you do your homework before you make any comments, you know? Uh, and I would. And I would. But that's the thing. It's so daunting. It's so huge. And as you said, it's complicated. And then World War Two happens in the middle, you know, <laughs> like just to make it even more complicated. Right. Like then, like, you know, so I I there's actually a lot, some historical events like that that I, I know that I could never fully cover. And revolutions are those a lot of times those events because there are so fascinating, such interesting things to study, but they are always complicated. They're always complex. They are hotbeds for historical myths, though. It's actually kind of I'm, I gravitate towards like I, I think the French Revolution. Talk about eras that I actually love. I think the French Revolution is one of the most interesting things, wild things, scary things crazy things inspiring at times horrifying at other times there's so much to learn right from that event but for what i do on my podcast it might actually be too big for me um to like really give people the right scope of it now of course there is a great podcast out there called revolutions uh by mike duncan who is sort of the one of the granddaddies of history podcasting um he used to do a show called the history of rome which was very popular and very early uh, podcast about exactly what it sounds like it's about the history of Rome, and then he moved on to Revolutions, which is great. Like, I mean, if you love a history podcast, he's just a great a great history teacher. Like breaking down very complicated events into really digestible thirty minute episodes. Um, so, but you know, it took him fifty of those to get through the French Revolution, right? And and like almost uh, two hundred. I feel like over a hundred to get through the Russian Revolution. Um, and, but yeah, he needed them, you know, and cause he did a very balanced and thoughtful take on both of those events that, you know, again, the closer you get to now, the more hot people feel about stuff, especially if the people involved are, are living or the people, people are living who were affected by the historical event because they got skin in the game. So I often, I, I actually generally don't do like 20th century topics where I kind of go right up to world war one. Sometimes I talk about beyond that. I have done topics about the 1950s and 1960s. It does come up. And again, I don't want to limit myself. Like there will be a day when I do a topic about like the eighties, I'm sure. Uh, but I, man, especially those ones that like, you know, where, where, especially the political ideologies you're talking about are still current existing political ideologies like the fact that, you know, like, again, it's hard to talk about the Chinese Communist Party when the Chinese Communist Party still exists and still is a government in the world. And people have very strong opinions about the Chinese Communist Party one way or another. Right. And and also, you know, I have to remember who I am in all of this. Right. So like and I so this is kind of goes to a bigger thing about the podcast. Is, you know, I have to remember and this is maybe one of the best lessons I got from teaching, and especially teaching in a place like Toronto, which is an incredibly multicultural city. And, you know, I, I know I'm jumping all over the place, but we're, I'm going to tell you a couple of things about teaching in Toronto. But let me just let me just start here. 
what I learned is that I needed to be, I needed to remember that I was a, uh, a, a like white Anglo Canadian dude going in front of a class of people that did not identify that way usually. Right. Um, when I was in teachers college, this is like 2011, they showed us a statistic and they said, you know, right now in the city of Toronto, you, the classrooms are 80% people that are, do not identify as, you know, white, uh, identify as some other ethnicity, 80%. And that's like, that makes sense. That actually makes perfect sense for what we know about the demographics of the city. But the teaching staff is the exact inverse, at least then 2011. I, I, it has changed since then. I'm sure the, in the 10, 12 years now that have passed, uh, I believe the teaching staff of the TDSB Toronto district school board has become more diverse, but at the time, the teaching staff was 80% folks that identified as white people and the and and 20% who did not right so it just it just meant that the teachers were from a different cultural community than their students and so you just got to be now i i am a firm believer that we can bridge that gap if but we always have to come at it with a real open heart right and so you have to be thoughtful and patient and ready to listen and ready to learn yourself. God, I didn't mean to get this preachy. <laughs> I didn't mean to get this preachy. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm That's going. okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm going, but you really do. But I, I truly believe this, that I think these gaps can be bridged, but we need to be just like, open, open to one another. And what I found was that my students of all different backgrounds would accept me if they knew that I was open, you know, if I knew that I was coming, you know, was, was coming at the coming, coming there with an open heart. Um, and so I actually tried to bring that to now just telling stories, right? Especially when you're telling a story that isn't about your culture. And I want to be able to tell stories from all over the world, every single corner of the world, because there's good stories from every corner of the world. But when it's not your culture, you need to be, you need, it doesn't, I don't think it means you can't tell the story. It just means that you need to be reading the people who are the most qualified to to uh to to sort of speak on that topic you need to be very aware of what your voice is and how your voice might be perceived um and what i found is that thankfully uh, so far i've gotten mostly mostly the vast majority of it positive feedback from people that feel like i i approached a story that is kind of their story uh, with at the very least empathy and the 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 uh the willingness to do my homework right that's the other thing people appreciate it's like okay well, at least this guy read the books you know ah <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah so there you go i'm sorry i got really uh got really uh i don't know yeah no that that, that, that was beautiful that that was amazing yeah you i'm so happy you brought up all of those points because that's essentially a big part of why I had episode five of my podcast, because in my example, I realized that there were so many misconceptions that, especially post-COVID, a lot of mm. Canadians had so many misconceptions about my culture, you know, sure. myself being of Chinese descent, right, of mm -hmm. Chinese heritage. So and it doesn't help that there's the political situation, right, of a certain political party or a certain set of political parties. And very, as you said, very, very strong opinions yeah. about that within my Chinese diaspora and sure. myself being born and raised in Canada while also being of Chinese heritage. Yeah. My view is also different from even those who are of Chinese heritage who were in, you know, mainland China, sure. Taiwan, Macau, Hong Kong. Yeah. So what they know, I may not know. And what I know, they may not know. Right. right. So right. even talking about that history, even within the diaspora, is very difficult because there could be a lot of infighting. And that's one of the reasons oh, why yeah. whenever I talk about culture, whether if it's on episode five 
of my podcast or even here or any future episodes, I try my absolute best not to talk about the politics of it. Mm-hmm. Culture at some point will touch on a bit of politics because they do somewhat go hand in hand. But at some point, I'm like, there's plenty of political podcasts out there. Yeah. They can do th- that. That's their job. But my job is just to talk about the culture. If there is something political, I'll acknowledge it. But I'll also say I won't go and do that. That's political and that kind of thing. So, well, what I love doing, I've actually here's my my favorite thing is that you go back far enough in the past, you can really dive into the politics of another time. And then if people draw parallels between what was happening then and what's happening now, then that's good. The, the hope is that maybe you can open people's minds to something, but you can take the sting out of it because you're not talking about, you know, the, uh, our current our current specific political situation, right? If you're talking about the politics of the 1700s, you know, there's going to be things that don't apply to us anymore, but then there's going to be things that kind of do, or or there will be political scenarios that you can kind of get into that are like, well, that's not all that different from, from things that you may have lived through. But it takes the sting out of it because like people like aren't aren't riled up about, you know, like the politicians of the 1700s anymore. <laughs> Right. Or they or you know, it's just it just doesn't have the sting. Right. Whereas like, you know, even if we were to talk about like, you know, for instance, like a historical figure like Ronald Reagan, right, in 1980s America, right? That's that's one that still has like people have feelings about that, right? And and you know, that's so it, it gets tricky, or just like you just gotta be ready that if you're gonna put that out on the internet, that y- you are kind of courting. A, a conversation that is still ongoing, right? And so if you're ready for that, then God love you. I, I I know what you mean, though. I also try and uh, avoid those. But when I do want to get into them, I'm coy. Uh, and I, I, I find that I sometimes gravitate to topics that remind me of now but I try not to say it too much, right? And let other people kind of maybe connect the dots. I just did a really fun topic about uh, Germany in the, again, turn of the century, 1906 Germany. So this is like pre-World War I Germany, the Kaiserreich, right? So when they still have, um, they have like a constitutional monarchy, but the Kaiser has a lot of power. Um, And what you find there is that, you know, the stereotype about the time is that the Germans were super militaristic and the army kind of ran the country. And that's why they got into World War One, because they were this like super, super militaristic people. And that is not really the whole story at all. Right. That that is a stereotype. The stereotype comes from, you know, there is a truth there, but not the whole truth. Right. The part of the truth is that, yeah, the military did have all this power of and influence and the military did have a lot of prestige and everyone had to serve in the military. Like if you were a, every young man at the age of 20 had to go and do four years of active service and then you were in the reserve until you were four years old. Right. And if I'm getting those numbers exactly wrong, I'm sure people will correct us. But uh, but that's basically it. Right. So you it was a militarized society and the military did have a lot of power and influence. And like that is true. But. A deeper truth is that Germany in the turn of the century was a way more dynamic society. And what you see is like a really active press. You see actually a liberalizing society in a lot of ways, uh, a society that is sort of shifting leftward in in many respects, which is prompting this response from like kind of the conservative military types. Um, And and you get actually it's a bit of like a a culture war going on in their media and every little news event gets picked up by uh, uh, newspapers, uh, which were the main media of the day of different political persuasion uh, persuasions, and then framed in a way to help sort of support whatever sort of larger political point they're making at the moment. And wow, doesn't that like feel so (laughs) contemporary, right? It's like, Oh, this thing that maybe we think of as just a now thing is no, like there, here's a time and place where there was very much a, a kind of roiling culture war. And sometimes one side would get the edge and kind of move the needle in one direction politically. And then sometimes the other side would get the edge and move the needle politically. And um, and that to me is is 
so fascinating, right? And so, but but there's an example of a time and a place that is a little less charged for people right now, right? It, it would be harder actually to talk about Germany in the 1930s, right? And the rise of the Nazi party. And, you know, God, because partially because if you say, have anything that's like Nazi content, you put it on the internet, you're going to like all of a sudden, like real ass Nazis are going to show up in the comments, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just know, I don't want that. I've, I don't, I've really avoided any of that content partially because of that. Um, but all of a sudden the Kaiser Reich though, people are like, Oh, I'm kind of curious about this. I don't know a lot about this. I want to learn about this. And then you can maybe, you know, stand back and, and it can hopefully, hopefully give you some insight about our own moment. And my job is just to try and not be too heavy handed about it and, and kind of tell the story and then let people hopefully draw their own connections, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's another thing about history is that one of the reasons why it's so important to learn about history is that it also informs the culture that is in that area from that point in history all the way till now. So a great example is when I had a number of years ago, I had a conversation with my law colleagues at the time about the conception of love. Right. Okay, cool. So love it. <laughs> they, <laughs> they were under the impression that their definition and so, so they were all they were all white, or most of them were white. Sure. Right. White Canadians. They they believed that their definition of love as mostly prim- prioritizing romance and affection is the only universal definition of of every single culture's definition <laughs> of love, sure. which is not true. Certainly not true. Not. So it's funny because Dr. Sang in episode five covered this. We covered that for actually about almost a whole hour. I think even longer than that. But he essentially said that from his research, because his research, aside from being a psychotherapist and a social worker, he also did a lot of research on human relationships. And he had a course where he had learners from every single country in the world except for maybe north korea talk about the cultural definitions of love Mm. and what he found was that while the conception of love is there while there is such thing as the concept of love in every culture how it's defined is very different across cultures Sure, right. Of course. So, like yeah. in my culture, we focus more on loss, sacrifice, duty, responsibility, honor, sure. integrity, yeah. romance, not so much, right? And in some circles, in in some philosophies like Confucianism, it's actually viewed as a negative thing and to avoid at all costs because it would actually affect one's duty and responsibility to the other person or right. to their families. Yeah. So, right. yeah, I've, I've I've read about that. Yeah. Yeah. That Confucian it's, idea that it's like it's all about who are you to me and who am I to you and am I doing my job and are you doing your job? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And also like your families, your parents' families too, right? That still very much informs the Chinese culture today. Like mm-hmm. I still live like even in my family, we still live that sort of ideal, right? Mm-hmm. We're not sure. Confucianist by any definition we're not no but it's just so part of chinese culture that it's just there yeah exactly exactly so and i remember at the time when i had that conversation people were angry they're just like oh this is wrong no no no. i lost a couple (laughs) friends too i was like oh my goodness that's funny yeah that's funny (laughs) i mean but that's the thing sometimes it's hard that's why it's important to like I mean, if you have the means to travel, and I know it's like kind of a privileged thing to be like, this is why everyone should travel. But I know that's like a terribly privileged thing to say. But if you can, you should, <laughs> because it can knock you out of that. Um, and I remember thinking that I was such a cosmopolitan person before I actually traveled. And then I went abroad and realized how damn Canadian I was. You know, I just like because I re- I didn't even know I didn't fully appreciate the level of cultural biases that I had. And I still have. Right. Like and and ones that I realized I'm like, oh, I actually like this thing. But this thing is not true for everyone. Um, But uh, yeah, no, that's fascinating. And you know what? The, even even what you're talking about, we can see that constructed historically. Right. The idea of romantic love, even in like European cultures, is something that evolves. 
right? And and takes time to evolve. And like, and even the idea that you that your partner, like the person you marry, is the person that you are the most in love with, like that's an idea that that is only a, a few hundred years, like maybe two hundred years old, mm-hmm. yep. right? Um, like it's like the eight nineteenth century, may look eighteenth century a bit, but like uh, the idea of a love match is like you know was c- kind of rare before then, and and even go further back, and th- there was always this idea of like really intense personal connections, but. Um, it was usually thought that like you had that actually most primarily with your friends. Um, and in the, this is in a lot of European cultures, but then of course, different European cultures differ, right? Like there's a lot of difference between the, the, you know, how we, how they conceptualize love in, you know, Spain compared to England. Right. And, uh, and, you know, let alone, let alone how it's being conceptualized in, you know, uh, you know, in, in China, right. Or Japan or in, uh, you know, the Philippines or wherever, right. You name your place. Um, yeah, actually the one thing that's, uh, that, you know, you always get w- w- when you look at the historical record and again, why I love those times of first contact is, um, a lot of, uh, like indigenous cultures that were contacted by Europeans didn't have quite the same ideas uh, of monogamy as uh, a lot of your, Euro- of Europeans, and I mean, there was marriage, there was the idea of families. Like, I mean, this is, don't get me wrong. I don't want to, you know, be completely incorrect here. And I also don't want to play it with a broad brush, right? All of these different cultures had every, uh, all the all these different conceptions, but often they would bump into people in places where it wasn't the idea that you could have sex with someone that wasn't your like primary partner was, was fine. Right. And so these sailors were like, woohoo, all right. You know, all right, I can just go wild here. But what they didn't, what they didn't often, not always, but often they didn't take time to learn like, yeah, you know, having sex is fine, but then there are other things we expect of you. Like, no, you don't, I don't expect you to marry this person, but like, you know, now it, it you do need to come over and kind of tend my garden for a bit. Like that's kind of part of it, you know, like, or again, I'm kind of using just an example off the top of my head, but like there were other, other things that were sort of required or expected. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, often it was just people were, were, uh, were not, were they, 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 they it, it took a minute for people to fully appreciate, you know, the, uh, what they were getting themselves into as, and just, they really got all these, you know, you get all these accounts, especially when they hit Polynesia and like, you know, these sailors would be like, Oh my God, these women are, are just up for, up for sex. But then it was like, yeah, that's while that is, that is true. But like, that doesn't mean that you can have sex with them anytime you want. And in any place that you want, and that doesn't mean that, and, and also like it, it, it means that like you now actually kind of do have certain responsibilities to the family, even though you're not expected to necessarily marry them. Like anyway, sorry, I'm again, I'm on a, I'm on a tangent here, but it's, I hear you. I hear you. That concept, the feeling of affection is I think a universal human feeling, but of course the kind of cultural ideas around partnership are of course as as diverse as there are cultures on the planet you know yeah yeah exactly it's it's all down to the cultural emphasis and for for my culture for pretty much almost all of it even up until the present day there are so many cultural emphases that still exist from thousands of years ago that still exist to this day right there are still areas in China, in some of the more rural areas, there are still areas in China where they still practice arranged marriages. Sure. Right. So, yeah. and on top of that, I had a colleague who was Tamil, mm-hmm. and he said that even within his, even even with with some of the friends that he knew, some of his Tamil his Tamil friends, some of them actually also wanted an arranged marriage too. They actually asked for one. So there's this also this common Western conception is like, oh, arranged marriage is X, Y, Z. Like they have this already preconceived notion of that yeah. as one thing. But what they don't realize is that not everyone thinks that it's a bad 
thing. And I'm not saying I'm not saying what I'm feeling. I I don't have any opinion on no, that I, because I, I'm like I'm out of the question. They're like count me out. <laughs> but what I am saying is that like for example, my colleague, his friends thought it was a good thing, and they want. I mean, they asked for one, right? So so there's always two sides to every story. In this mm-hmm. case, there's always many sides to every story, yeah. right? So I mean, even something to to bring something a little bit a little bit less contentious. The War of eighteen twelve, Canadians sure. Americans always argue who who won the war. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I got a, I mean, a three part series all about it, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, just just going to offend all my Americans, but the Canadians won. Yeah, fight me in the comments, Americans. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It, yeah, that is, that is that is actually objectively true. Yeah, uh, and uh, that I mean, and if people are curious about why I'd say that, I got I got like three hours worth of content that can break it all down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, <laughs> but also, you know what? I also learned that there are a number of myths about that conflict that Canadians need to let go of. Right? Mm. There, Canadians also have a lot of things that that are part of our identity, right? Uh, especially like Anglo Canadian identity from Ontario, like my, like my identity, (laughs) you know, like Anglo Ontario identity has a lot tied up in the war of 1812. Um, But what I found so fun about that one is when you start reading about it, it's like, Oh, this is one of the, like those conflicts where both sides thought they were the underdog. Right. Because uh, America were, were fighting great Britain. Right. They were fighting the British Empire. And so they were like punching above their weight. But Canadians perceive that as like, no, America was trying to invade Canada. We are the underdog. We are the kind of place that like had a smaller military and and like a smaller population. And yet, you know, we not we we saw them off. Right. The Canada remained uninvaded and. And eventually, you know, the, the British Army, with many Canadians in the ranks, uh, Canadian colonials at the time, right, actually occupied, you know, good chunks of, you know, uh, what is today Maine and Vermont and like a good chunk of, you know, the northern United States. But the American memory of the war is that they went the distance with Britain and they like held their own and they scored a couple really good victories and they did well. Their Navy did well, right. Against the British Navy, no less, right. The little American Navy, you know, really held its own. And so, you know, and the big things that are remembered on the American side are famous defenses, which is fascinating because America declared war on great Britain. America launched an invasion, but their great, moments are moments where they were on the defense that tells you everything right so like the battle of new orleans which is a famous defense where again to their credit the americans saw off a big british attack but again they were on the defense on a war that they started right and then also the the uh the bombardment of baltimore which is what the Star Spangled Banner is written about, right? The American National Anthem is written about that, right? But again, that's about that the city of Baltimore, the fort. They're holding out against this bombardment from from the uh, from the British Navy, right? Again, great, they did it. They're not lying about that. That happened, but these were defensive moments. Anyway, that's a small rant about the war of 1812 yeah no that it's it's <laughs> i can already i can already picture, picture the pitchforks that our american viewers oh no, but you know what it's fun but i i at the end of that i actually compared uh you know the american memory of that war to the way people remember the first rocky movie and you know at the end of the first rocky movie rocky does not win Rocky loses the fight to Apollo Creed, but it feels like he wins, doesn't it? Right? Because he goes the distance and it, he's he, he, he raises his fists like he won, yeah. <laughs> even though technically he didn't. That's the War of 1812, right? Like, and America gets to be Rocky. And this is where I really, you know, you know, massage the feelings of my men. Most of my listeners are from the United States. Uh and uh, and my mom is actually uh, born in 
born in the United States. So I'm technically half American. So I felt like I was the person, perfect person to tell that story. Talk about a story that is my culture. This is about Anglo Canada versus America. Like, come on. I am the guy to tell the story. Um, but, uh, yeah, but that's like they got to be rocky in this analogy. You know, they go the distance with the champ, um, but they technically don't win. But they get a great peace settlement. And that's the other thing of it, right? There's sometimes it's said that America lost the war, but they won the peace. And I do believe that is true. They 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 got they their negotiators did really well around the the uh, the final sort of treaty table. Um, and uh and so that's part of it as well, that like, you know, it, it kind of comes off like a bit of a draw uh, just because of like they sent their A team to go negotiate that treaty. And Britain at the time was negotiating uh, another series of treaties to end the Napoleonic Wars, right? The Treaty of Vienna was being negotiated right at the same time. And so the British had sort of sent their A team negotiating team to Vienna to like negotiate the end of this massive war that had consumed Europe, right? And they kind of had their B team negotiating with the Americans and the Americans sent their best guys, you know, and they got a great deal <laughs> as a result, you know? Yeah. So that's part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to help our American, our American audience feel even better, I think an even, an even better battle that's put more recent would be the battle of the bulge in world war two. Oh, sure. That's a big one because the Germans out of nowhere, just attacked the American line. It was a very thin line too. They were encircled. They had they had no supplies, or they had a very very limited supply line. But they were able to fight off the German advance, and basically may still maintain 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 a strong position there to you know further advance in. But that was a very 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 brutal battle where they yeah. they really went the distance and fought off the Germans at that point in time. Yeah. That's a I think. You know, an example of a a going the distance that actually did win an, an actual victory. Yeah. Many many losses were there, but man, that was one one crazy battle. Well, that's Rocky Four. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, so that's yeah. the thing. The later big American victories, where like America can't be stopped, kind of colors your memory of those early ones, right? Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and it's funny because there's also there are a number of World War II battles that the Americans fought. Like I think Brecourt Manor was one where Richard Winters actually, well, he he commanded that 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 attack, and they won that so decisively that even up until his death in 2010, 2011, he still taught about that battle in, at West Point. And also mm. different military academies all across the U.S. Because that that the tactics that he used then were still being used as like a baseline for even current military in mm. in the U.S. So it's funny because certain moments are so proud that it's not just cultural pride, but it's also literal like either military pride or actual political pride or or logistic pride that translates into how you can even do things today. And that's also what's fascinating about history is, is because you can still learn about those lessons. It's one thing, it's it's one thing to to say that history, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. But it's a whole other thing to say that you know when you learn from history, you can also repeat the good things that came out of it as well. Yeah. Right. So, and that's what's fascinating about history. Yeah. Well, you know, and what the one thing that's tricky about history is that I've learned that it, you can find a historical example for almost any scenario that has played out. So if you're like, this will probably happen because this happened before. Yes, but keep searching history and you'll find, you know, a, a similar set of circumstances where the opposite thing happened. This has been sort of one of my more recent, you know, uh, I won't say epiphanies because other people I'm sure have figured this out before, but things that I, I come back to. Uh, history tells us how things can happen but not how things will happen and so it's important to know how things can go and so we can yeah so we can avoid potential pitfalls so we can potentially plan but it it gets <laughs> it it gets so complicated it's like well what I, I sometimes fret over this like what lessons should we take from history and I mean the biggest thing that I've I I I come back to is that 
the situation is always more complicated than you want it to be. That is one thing that in general, that like the more you look at something, the more you realize it's, there's always more complexity. So if someone is trying to uh, portray things as very kind of black and white, very simple, very like, here's what you need to understand about this. Here are the three takeaways. And this is what we do all the time as teachers, right? Uh, You have to be careful with that. You have to be skeptical of that. Um, Because what I've found is that every situation is more complex than than you want it to be. And here's the thing. Complexity actually makes it hard to sometimes shape things into a story. And so I think, uh, you know, being historians struggle with this, but also, you know, people doing, you know, what, I, what I do, like the, the, the humble history podcast out there, who's uh, trying to kind of take complicated, you know, human events and, and turn them into a story. I, uh, sometimes that complexity can make the storytelling hard, but, the story is better if you allow for those complicated bits. Yeah. And then the other thing I like to go back to as well to kind of simplify it is uh, there's an old Mark Twain quote. I don't know if you've heard this one, but it's, uh, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And uh, I believe that. I think he was right about that, that, that history rhymes, but it doesn't quite repeat itself. And so if you can kind of hear a rhyme coming, if like the cat is rhyming with Matt, then like maybe you're like, oh, maybe we should change the rhyme scheme a little bit here. You know, that's what I, I, I believe. Yeah. But, but, you know, with that said, that doesn't mean we can't, we, why even study it? It's too complicated. It's like, no, no, no. It deepens you as a person. I, I think it, it, a really deep understanding of history should actually make you a more empathetic person because it reminds you of, or at least it reminds me of how, you know, human beings have been trying to sort of deal with this weird thing that is human existence for as long as we've been around and that those struggles are actually not as distant from the ones that, you know, we have. And it also reminds me of, it it can actually be a a comfort in the chaotic moments that we've lived through to remember that other people have lived through moments more chaotic, you know? Yeah. Thought about that a lot during the pandemic. Yeah. Just like, God, this is just like, you know, it was so out of the ordinary for our lifetime. It felt, it could, it felt pretty apocalyptic. And I took a lot of solace in stories from the past that were kind of apocalyptic moments themselves, but just a reminder that, you know, people have endured, <laughs> endured it. Uh, and that doesn't mean don't take crises seriously. We very much should take crises seriously, but also remember that th- this ain't the first crisis, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I, I agree, you know, learning a history essentially deepens your understanding of who you are as a person. Yeah. Right. And you, it also gives you a further understanding as to why people think a certain way, why certain cultures act a certain way, why certain societies are run in a certain way. Right. Yeah. And it also gives more context into how, how, a, how it's not even just, just people like, people to people social behaviors but even how certain technologies are developed or even how certain concepts are developed in in literary works as well can be developed a, as well for me I, I guess i forgot to mention this as well one other thing that i'm also fascinated about is music history uh, as oh, a classical yeah. pianist because a big one is frederick chopin yeah yeah frederick chopin there are still so many i mean there, there there's an international music competition that happens once every 5 years mm-hmm. where the the world's greatest pianists compete to see who can interpret chopin the best right yeah and it's cool. always so contentious because how do you judge a chopinesque <laughs> performance and on top of that how do you judge the best one out of that right yeah so there's yeah the, yeah the good news is there are so many manuscripts that chopin wrote and also other interpreters have done in the past up until his death and even afterwards that give us a very good consensus as to how it should sound as well as 
a number of his pianos are still well preserved and were actually uh, used at this year's period instrument version of the international Chopin competition because oh, there's cool. two of them there's the the modern the standard one which uses our modern grand pianos mm -hmm. and then there, there's the period instruments which uses the 1800s era pianos cool. cool and the way how it sounds is so different and because it's so different there's also a different way how a pianist needs to approach even playing that being sure. conscious of the history because it actually because if you want to make a grand piano sound like that you got to touch the instrument differently very very differently yeah well i wouldn't say it's cool. like is, is love have, that yeah love that that's yeah. cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I wouldn't say you have to reinvent the wheel when you're playing but like your yeah. approach to it has to be very very different right sure so so actually, funny enough, actually, our most recent uh, winner is actually a Canadian, uh, a, oh, yeah? a Chinese Canadian by the name of Eric Guo. Uh, so a bit of Canadian pride and also Way Chinese to go, pride. Eric. Yeah. So the most <laughs> Chopin-esque performance. Well performance. done, Eric. Love yeah, it. yeah. He, he, um, yeah, he, he, he did great. He, he, he was amazing. But, do you, so but, do you compete or do you judge this event or what do you, what do you, how are you? Oh, no, no, no. I, I mean, I don't hold a candle to you. You just follow it. I, I follow it. So, so first of all, the international competition is held in Warsaw. Okay. Uh, and, and second right, of all, because because Chopin was Polish, Polish. So he's yeah. half Polish, half French, but he heavily identifies with his Polish side. Yeah. So he even I visited that, his grave in Paris once. Actually, he's in yeah. Paris Cemetery. He's got a beautiful headstone. Actually. Yeah. Because yeah. I think he, I, I, if I recall correctly, he said, "When I'm buried, bury my body in France, but bury my heart in Poland." Oh. So really? his heart is actually preserved in Warsaw, beautiful. and. They recently, two years ago, I think, they actually exhumed his heart from the cathedral. Okay. For a further autopsy on what happened because he died of tuberculosis. Oh, okay. Right. But they wanted to see like the extent of damage and see what happened and see like just how bad it was and like any Ooh. other factors that may have led to, you know, the death of Chopin. The, the yeah. death, his death, right? I don't remember. I only skimmed through that document briefly when I when I read it, so I'm not sure what the details were. But I think there were some interesting developments that came after, even just two years ago. So, huh. cool. um, so interesting. But yeah, no, no, like even even the way how how Chopin's life was even formulated. And not formulated, but how we understood Chopin at the time, the consensus has also generally shifted and changed slightly, even because there were Love certain that. events that I think were, were they weren't myths, but they were a little bit of an exaggeration at some points, sure. right? But, sure. uh, there, but and a lot actually, a lot of the kind of great. Uh, well, great artists in general have a lot of mythology. And I love kind of artists' lives as well. When I, you know, because they're they're always interesting, they're always fascinating. But like you know, just talking about like nineteenth century composers, right? There's like tons of myths about Beethoven. I actually want to do a Beethoven uh, episode, and uh, my middle name is actually Amadeus. Wow! <laughs> so, and I was because my parents saw the the movie, right? They went and saw. Uh, you know, the, obviously the film Amadeus, uh, and I was like in the womb and apparently kicking the whole time. And so they made my middle name Amadeus. Uh, but Mozart, again, uh, another figure that, you know, is uh, semi mythological. Um, I need to do, though, both of those guys are on the list Mozart and, and Beethoven. Maybe Chopin should be on the, the list as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I should say that, I mean, I mean, I did compete, but I didn't compete in the, in the Chopin competitions. I mean, I, 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 at one point I was training for the Canadian Chopin competition, but I was like, I, I didn't want to give up school. So, sure. and oh, yeah, you that level of training, I had to give up school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, essentially. Yeah. It, it's, wow. it's pretty intense. Well, well, give up school. Well, I, in terms of give up school, it's basically like, like if you want to go to school, it has to be in the music degree. Oh, I see. Right? Because right. that it gives you more time to practice and you get to understand it fully. Right. You know, that, that sort of thing. And right. I should, pro and I should be very, very clear. Like, I'm, I don't hold a candle to any of the guys who go to the who judge the international Chopin competition because because they they've been doing they've been judging these competitions and they've understood Chopin sure. for their sure. entire lives right so sure. and they're they're much far far older than me so these I are don't... these are people with PhDs in in music and what have you yeah exactly exactly yeah. or they won won previous international ah, Chopin competitions as well sure talking about Mozart. It's funny. I'm talking about Amadeus, the movie, actually, yeah. is fascinating because there were actually some myths that came out of that one, too. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. like, the movie made Salieri look like he was, like, 
the sworn <laughs> enemy of Mozart, which yeah. wasn't true. No, they were rivals ish, but there were certain moments where they actually did cooperate on some works. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I, again, that is something I want to go into research. But again, that, you know, the that film is based on the play of the same name. Right. And that whole idea of, you know, Salieri and Mozart having this great rivalry and Salieri being there when Mozart dies and like all that, all of that is is the from the imagination of the playwright originally. But this is the thing. This is actually how a lot of historical myths get birthed. Right. That Mm -hmm. someone will actually create a piece of historical fiction. Right. And I'm forgetting who wrote the play Amadeus, but um But they created a work of historical fiction and they were clear at the time, like this is historical fiction. This is me imagining, you know, the life of Mozart based on history, but, you know, uh, dramatized. Right. Uh, But, you know, for a lot of people, the only thing, the only time they'll ever learn about Mozart is by seeing that movie. And it's a wonderful movie. I love it. I, by the way, like, let me say, I actually, you know, visited it as an adult and saw it actually on a big screen once and loved it loved it and it makes you excited about the music actually if you that's like a and that to me is actually a great you know historical film but like don't come away from that going like now i know the details of mozart's life because you don't you you saw a piece of historical fiction Right. It's like watching Bridgerton and being like, now I understand like Georgian England. It's like, no, you don't. <laughs> you had fun watching, a, you know, a historically themed sex romp or whatever the hell it is. You know, you had fun and great and power to you. And by the way, I don't mind that. I'm not I don't mean to to dump on it. Right. But like, be, be, understand what it is. Right. And and Amadeus is no different. Right. Yeah. And uh, and like Braveheart is no different, right? In fact, a lot of historically themed films are are no different. Yeah. Right now, the the new that new Napoleon movie is coming out, right? And it's getting all sorts of flack for being historically inaccurate. And um, and I was actually I, this past season, I, I spoke to a, a movie critic, a woman named Amy Nicholson. She writes for the New York Times. We're talking about historical accuracy in films, and you know a lot of times people think that I must be a real stickler for it because of, you know, the podcast that I do. Uh, and, and the truth is I, I'm not as long as the movie is sort of clear about what it is. And she made the really good point that as soon as that movie presents itself, like maybe it could be a teaching tool, then it's, that's when it can maybe be dangerous. Right. So like, you know, like I'm a, like some of the, like people will show like saving private Ryan in a history class. Right. Because, you know, so many people prided themselves on creating not just Spielberg, but the whole team creating a depiction of uh, D day that many veterans believed was incredibly accurate. Right. And so as a history teacher, you go like, well, it's kind of got the stamp of approval. We'll go, we'll, we'll watch this. Now, a lot of other things about that movie are like, not necessarily accurate right so that's in a way maybe more like if it's got like it's got this one really super accurate sequence and then other stuff that's like oh i made that probably wouldn't happen like that and you know so that's when it maybe things actually get you know a bit more tricky and that's the thing about the napoleon movie is that i think well we'll see i'm actually curious to see it i will certainly see it but you know, I, I saw uh, Oppenheimer this summer. Went into the went to the movies, and I'm I'm a I'm a father of two, like young kids. So getting to the movies is so hard these days. <laughs> uh, but I I went by myself. I like did like a daddy day by himself, and went to like one of those VIP theaters and sat down and watched Oppenheimer, and I loved it. I really enjoyed it. But it made me want to go back and be like, okay, how accurate is this movie? Because it presents itself like it is extremely true to life. Right. And it's like mostly true to life with some dramatized moments. Right. And so that one's like an interesting one. It's like, it's, you know, because there's so much sex in it, they probably won't show it in a classroom, but people might, people will watch it and will come away being like, now I know the story of the bomb. You know, 
Right. And that's not necessarily, I mean, I don't think that one's particularly irresponsible, but like you should still read the book or, or read the books, plural. You should still, if you, if you want to really truly feel like, you know, you know, the history of the atom bomb, like you, you still got to go, you can't rely on, on Hollywood. Um, so yeah, that's just me riffing on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, 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 that's great. Yeah. And that's true. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Another good example is the films, the Ip Man uh, film ser- series. Oh yeah. Ip Man, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ip Man, because that's not historically accurate. For no, the most part. no, it's not. No, I've heard that those movies are like, especially the later movies, the later sequels, I hear they get pretty ridiculous. Actually, Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, like you, you're fighting your, I mean, you have Ip Man in his advanced age fighting and beating a, a racist drill sergeant. It's like, wait, yeah. what? Yeah. I've never seen that before. That's never happened before. But that, I, but I mean, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. So I, I got to know that again, <laughs> this is again, teaching a, a whole, a really diverse group of people. I, I had this one assignment where uh, kids had to choose a movie poster. And I showed them how to do um, like, we, we, we had this whole unit go leading up to it about like analyzing images and like breaking down how stories can be told with the arrangement of images. Movie posters are great to analyze for that because they have to like suggest the story of the movie. Um, you know, so it's, in, it's a, there's a, it's an easy one. It's a great kind of training wheel sort of way to sort of start um, you know, breaking down like how an image can be arranged to like suggest an entire story. Um, and uh, so I let the kids really choose any movie they wanted. Right. Uh, to, to do this assignment for. And uh, many of my Chinese students, especially if their Ch- Chinese was their first language or Mandarin, I suppose, would, was their first language, uh, chose uh, Ip Man posters from the various Ip Man films. And I was like, I need to like actually look at what this is, because this is clearly incredibly popular among like a, a, a subset of my students. I got to know what this is. So I, I, I checked it out. And I mean, I get, I get it because it's like, oh, cool. It's like, you know who the greatest badass of all time was? It man. And guess what? He is Chinese. You know, <laughs> like I, I, I understand it, it but I, those later ones, you're like, oh, this is actually starting to become like almost propagandistic. Maybe the earlier ones, the earlier ones are booster e. The later ones are like, hey, China number one, America sucks. <laughs> And it's like, okay, interesting. But it's, but again, in, in this part of the world, we're not exposed to a lot of media that has it. You see a lot of media that's the other way around. You see tons of America number one, you know, whatever enemy we want as enemy de jour, you know, they're the worst. Right. And so we've seen ton of that, but it's, uh, it's always interesting when you, when you see it from a, a completely different culture. Um, but again, yeah, I know. And I know that even in, you know, uh, like Ip Man, Ip Man is a, 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 a semi mythological figure, uh, even without those movies, right? You know, there's Dude. so much mythology about that guy, Le- legend about his abilities. You know, to to be honest, the reason why Ip Man really took off the way it did was because it was originally marketed as the master of Bruce Lee, right? Of course, right? Yeah. So, aside from that, Ip Man, while yeah, to be honest, he was. At least for my personal opinion, some other Chinese people might disagree with me with this, but he wasn't he was not as important as people usually think he is. Honestly, sure. like he, he he was an amazing Wing Chun uh, uh, master. I mean, again, being being Bruce Lee's master, although even then it's it's you know it, it, he was he was he was just really skilled at what he what he did, right? And sure. really, it was that it's a lot of the myth came from the very fictional events that happened that came afterwards sure with all four of these movies and yeah you're right about the movies eventually becoming very propagandistic because number one some of it is the politics the modern politics yeah. i won't get into that no it it it, fe- it felt like i'm like i don't think this feels like it's about right now and what about like way yeah, where especially the government position is right now in modern china you know yeah yeah so some of it is political and second of all even ignoring that part for for even for just a second if you look at many hong kong kung fu movies or martial arts movies not 
all, of course. There were still many that weren't that, that don't go down this route, but there are many that do. There's a lot of Chinese victim mentality. Mm. Right? Interesting. Okay. Because part of this is based on fact. Not sure. all of it, but part of it is based on fact, right? So because there was a period of time in Chinese history where like there was colonialism and you know, am I getting? Am I stepping out of bounds here? Or? Yeah, yeah. Essentially, yeah. So there were a lot of inv- yeah. so there were a lot of invasions, like yeah. what was what were viewed as foreign invasions. And as I was alluding to earlier in the podcast, I mean, one of the reasons why Doctor Sun Yat Sen said, you know, drive out the Manchurians was because of that kind of mentality of, sure. you know, and also Han ethnocentrism at the same time as well. Sure. So many of the attitudes and the the sentiments of this paranoia from foreign invasion back during the Qing dynasty, because to be honest, the Qing were terrible at defending their own their own territory. Sure, the Qing dynasty, I should say. They uh, many Chinese citizens, or I mean, at the time, they they didn't really consider themselves Chinese. They they call themselves because it's I mean I'm I'm quoting what Doctor Sang said in episode five of my podcast. They refer to themselves as I'll use some candies, Dai Qing Guo or the Kingdom of Qing, right? So they yeah. were the residents of of Qing. So it wasn't uh, Zhang Guo yet or whatever. It wasn't it wasn't Zhong Guo or, yeah. or 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 Zhong Guo or yeah, or, it, yeah. It, yeah. It wasn't. Forgive my poor pronunciation. No worries. That that yeah. was really good actually. <laughs> um. So like modern China as a term, didn't exist until 1911. Or maybe if it did, the meaning wasn't as strong or it didn't really have much meaning, honestly. Like, because, And there was still like some regionalism that also happened at the same time as well. Of course. So trying to draw this back into today, some of the mentality is still there on top of what happened in World War II, especially with how Imperial Japan attacked China mm-hmm. in those days, and especially the atrocities that they did in Nanjing. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean that that event. I think apparently those events were so bad. Even some some Nazis were actually like shocked at how bad they were. Like the atrocities of how bad, which just goes to show you just how bad they were. Sure. I'm not going to sure. say about, about about any of them here on the podcast because they're very very graphic. Yeah, I know, and, and that information mm-hmm. is 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 wide widely av- available if people are interested in like most horrible events in history like yeah the, the rape yeah. of nanjing right like it's it's well known yeah exactly exactly so that sort of memory still exists to this very day sure still very much exists to this very day it's, it's also one of the reasons why japan to this day is still apologizing profusely for what happened or at least the government of japan is doing that mm-hmm. right so in cinema in hong kong cinema and really in chinese martial arts cinema it's it's almost like low hanging fruit to have, you know, especially in Ant Man one when the final the, the final big bad boss is a Japanese general, right? Sure. Of and course. it's not just that movie, but many movies like oh, the big bad boss is Japan, right? Right. You know, right. it's it, like it, when we make the Nazis the bad guys, you know, in 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 Western movies, they're easy. They're an easy, you know, you're not going to make it. There's going to be no controversy. When Indiana Jones fights a Nazi, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And the reason why Ip Man in particular took off so well wasn't because of its history, because it's, again, very mm-hmm. fictional. Sure. Of but course. because of, of the ideals that it tried to express out, mm-hmm. you know, being a proud Chinese person, being unified with one's own fellow countrymen mm-hmm. or country persons, you know? That sort of sentiment really stood out. Now, of mm. course, the, the martial arts scenes were also beautiful and also well sure. well created. And you know, even even the stance of, of Wing Chun, like like this, yeah. is very very unique in terms of from a cinematic perspective. But frankly, let me let, let me put it to you this way: Wing Chun is not a very useful martial art if you were to use it <laughs> on its own. There are some yeah. aspects aspects that would help you, but it's not. You're you probably might lose in a fight with a trained martial art. <laughs> it is a yeah, different sure. martial art, you know. Sure. So, well, I mean, well, one of the one of the sort of journeys I went on in the podcast was uh, I got I did a whole series on uh, myths associated with martial arts. I could probably do a whole other one with the ones I didn't get to, and uh, and yeah, what you what you find a lot of times is that many that one a lot of them have great 
like mystical origin stories that are completely made up, right? Because it's interesting how actually recent a lot of these art forms truly are, right? Like within the last 150 years, a lot of them, right? Um, but but the mythology of all of them is that these are ancient, right? That they go back thousands of years and uh and you know they were preserved in monasteries right and like um but and the other the other big thing that came up in that in that series was how uh asian nationalism plays into um the stories of a lot of them so i mean like you know uh, korean folks were you know like very convinced that like the not all korean folks but like there is a Korean mythology that like the best and most effective martial arts is Taekwondo because that is the Korean martial art. And then, but then there's, you know, even rivalries. There's another guy who has a, uh, a, a martial arts form called Hwarang Do. And I might be saying that incorrectly, but, and he claims that it's an even more ancient an even more Korean form of martial arts. And of course it's better than any Chinese martial art, or any Japanese martial art or any martial art from any other part of the world. Right. Because of just the natural, greatness of the Korean people, right? Uh, but then you see the exact same thing in Japan, right? And what's interesting is that many of the Japanese art forms actually come from, you know, kind of colonizers like Okinawa, right? Which is kind of has its own culture, right? Like it has been part of Japan for, again, a couple hundred years. But uh, but Okinawa is, is, it's in a way, you could argue is sort of its own distinct culture. And, you know, karate originates there but then when it gets brought to japan it gets it it evolves into the or it i shouldn't say evolves it gets taken on uh by the japanese military and sort of presented as like the most japanese thing and from then it's like you know what the best martial art is this one because it is the most pure to our people Right. And then, of course, the Chinese martial arts have the same thing, except I find that the Chinese martial arts have the best origin stories because like the the Kung Fu or origin story is is great. Right. With like the uh, um, uh, the Shaolin Temple. Uh, and uh, and and so that that one actually has like goes back to like, you know, it's from like it's like over uh, well over a thousand years old and like a traveling Buddhist monk from India like teaches uh teaches the the Shaolin monks like the moves of 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 kung fu and they preserve it and then it becomes like the most deadly and effective martial art there is right and this buddhist monk also has all of these like magical powers and he can do all this cool stuff and like you know he you know there's all these great stories about bodhidharma who is this like uh the kind of one of the the, the Shaolin uh, temple already existed, but he's sort of like the considered one of the great patrons of the of the uh, of the Shaolin temple. And then even Wing Chun, like Wing Chun has this. I don't know if you know the weird mythology of that, but it's believed that it's a they invent. So there probably wasn't a southern Shaolin temple, but the in the mythology of Wing Chun, they her their martial art was developed there at this other Shaolin temple. And it's like, there's another one. Oh yeah. Oh, totally. There is. And we can even take you to it. And like, and it's, so the idea, I believe that it was developed by a woman. It was developed by a nun, a Buddhist nun in the Wing Chun tradition. And then it gets taught to like a traveling circus is sort of part of it as well. So there's like this, like circus uh, period of time where Wing Chun kind of evolves. But then again, because of course, eventually, you know, Bruce Lee is sort of taught by, by Ip Man, it becomes like the, it, 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 the, the mythology grows. But what's cool about Bruce Lee and uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever gone deep on like the story of Bruce Lee. Uh, and I know mostly about it because of you know, another great history podcaster, a guy named Daniele Bolelli. If you've ever listened to History on Fire, uh, but he's a he's a friend. He's an excellent history podcaster, uh, and I love his stuff. He did a wonderful series about Bruce Lee, and you know Bruce Lee's whole thing was that he really wasn't an adherent to any one style. His style was constantly evolving. He took what he thought was effective from all sorts of styles of martial arts and sort of combined them into something that was truly. You know, talk about art, you know, that was truly artistic. That was truly a sort of personal thing. I forget 
uh, what he had his own martial art that he developed. Uh, do you know what it's called? I forget. You, you oh, Bruce Bruce Lee's martial art. Yeah, Tikundo. Ah, there you Tikundo. go. Yeah, there you go. That, um, that, and that's that's also the the, the Cantonese uh, pronunciation pronunciation of the uh, of the art. It's called a uh, Kundo. Cool. Yeah, even with the tones. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so he he, but but the whole idea of that, if I understand correctly, again, this is me filtering it through from like Daniele, but it, is that you know it's it's don't become too attached to any ideology, right? Don't become too attached to any one system, yeah. right? evolve move with it change right like learn i found that actually very inspiring i liked that because so much of you know martial arts is like this is a tradition yeah. and it's been passed down from thousands of years and and it, it has to be good because it's old and the old the old ways are the good ways so don't mess with it and your job is just to get perfect at the old way and you know to bruce lee's great credit as you know truly i i would say a great artist you know, was like, no, no, like yeah. keep evolving, keep changing, keep learning. Yes. Learn the old way, but then learn other ways and bring them in and, yeah. and mess and play around with it, you know, which yeah. is, you know, incredible considering, you know, he did more to popularize Asian martial arts around the world than maybe anybody else. Right. Like, yeah. And he, he was a great philosopher as well. Right. Yeah. So he on record, what he described he perfectly described it as be formless like water. Yeah, I've, right? I've heard that. So wonderful, you, wonderful quote. Yeah. You put water in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put yeah. water in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Right? Be so, like water, my friend. Yes. Yeah, be water. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so the, yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, exactly. Like you said that Ji uh, Hyun, though, is essentially premised on that, taking what works best for from other martial arts and also incorporating. And that's why many MMA fighters, many, especially UFC fighters, those who are in the UFC level, they look to him as the father of MMA because that's essentially the principle of, of what a lot of modern mixed martial art combat sports are like now. Mm. It takes from that because it, because at the end of the day, it's one thing to talk about tradition, but it's a whole th different thing to talk about. What are you going to do in a street fight, right? Right. There's no tradition right. there. It's fight or die. You know, yeah. so and that's why a lot of traditional martial arts, they still sort of hold up, but they're not complete. Right. And it's interesting because some martial artists, mixed martial artists even said there's not really such thing as a complete martial art even nowadays. Anyways, even with like the MMA or Muay Thai or, yeah. you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or whatever. Yeah. 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 Because because like. Like maybe like the. Clo I mean, I should, I should even be careful saying this. I, I shouldn't even use the word closest. Like the one that's really, really good is wrestling, like legit wrestling, not like sure. WWE wrestling, but actually like competitive wrestling. Sure. Because those guys are, first of all, those guys are, are tough. Sure. Like, like regardless of their gender, they are tough. They're, they're, yeah, they're sure. they are built. They're, they're, they're literally built differently. Yeah. And second of all, like their techniques are very, very good. Like they're actually very, very useful, right? A person's not going to be able to strike you if you're if if you're all already wrapped them around them and they're all around the ground yeah. and stuff, right? So, so it, I mean, in its simplest oversimplified form, there's like a standing game, like a standing art when you're on yeah. your feet and you're punching and kicking and blocking. But then there's also a ground game when you're on the floor, right? Yeah, so sure. that sort of thing. And then there's also you know it, it's it's so there's so many complexities even within that as well, right? But Bruce Lee did a really good job providing that kind of kind of understanding. And unfortunately, he ruffled a lot of feathers, especially even at home, even even in in Hong Kong and right. and, and in and in China. Maybe not as much as in Hong Kong because nowadays people really revere him a lot now. Sure, but at the time, he broke a lot of tradition. Sure, right. And there's sure. also even even recently, several years ago, there's a martial artist, a mixed martial artist, called uh, Xu Xiaodong. Mm -hmm. Who has been going across China just like taking down both fake martial artists, like ah, fake yeah. masters, yeah. and real masters, right? right? Because he's basically saying that like it doesn't work, right? Like, I mean, it's good as an exercise, and there are some good elements that come out of it, but it doesn't work on its own. Sure. Let me tell you, he is a target right now. 
She's sure. actually a target because it's because because a lot of people don't like that in, in, yeah. in China, right? Because it's like you're you're going up against our our own traditions and all that kind of stuff, right? So, like even right now, but the fact that he's still you know, you know, it, out there training and all that kind of stuff and and fighting and that stuff, like you know, like he he was breaking that mold, and that's like he's like um this is like a modern instance of breaking a previously preconceived notion, sure, but people don't take it very nicely you yeah know? it's it's interesting because like i mean you would hope that we could all evolve to the spot where people go like well this art form is yeah a form of exercise and it's also an expression of my culture you know mm. that's a beautiful thing but like why do we have to be so caught up on whether or not you can actually kick someone's ass with it but yeah. i guess that's part of the pride yeah. right like I'm, I'm proud of the fact that this expression of my culture can kick someone's ass yeah <laughs> yeah. To be fair, some of them were built as like also as d- defense mechanisms, right? Of course. But, but again, it's all up to uh, it's all it's comes back to oh, I don't want to like this has worked. I don't care. It works. It will yeah. always work despite what the evidence shows. That kind of thing, right? And it's it's yeah. that kind of stubbornness, I would even say to a certain extent that really yeah. causes a causes a lot a lot of problems. But you know what? what? It's funny you brought up wrestling because I told this last summer I did this whole series on American professional wrestling. And my whole question was, was it ever real? Yeah. Like, was there ever a moment like b- before it was theater? That was uh, and, RJ with RJ City, right? Yeah, RJ. Yeah. yeah. And and that was awesome. It was so great to have him. And he's so funny and like so candid and just like. I love him. And and it's just a crazy thing that we went to high school together. Um, and so that's how I got RJ on because me and him knew each other. Like he's a couple of years younger than me, but we were in the same uh, drama program. We both wow. came out of a arts intensive high school north of Toronto in, in uh, Markham, Ontario, Unionville specifically, if you know the, your geography of the uh, Toronto suburbs. Um, but uh, yeah, we were both drama students there. And that that drama program was very tight knit, and even like you know older students knew younger students. It was very, it was lovely. It was a lovely little kind of family there. Uh, so I knew RJ when he was like a kid, you know, when he was when I when I was seventeen and he was like fifteen, right, or fourteen. Uh, and uh, and he's gone on to have this really great wrestling career, and now has a really awesome gig with the AEW. Uh, now doing like you know he's a he's a kind of ringside commentator and then he has this great YouTube show, um, but anyway, uh, so that was great. Just having him on was actually just like a cherry on top, and he's just the best. Um, but um, I what I what I learned uh, is that there was a time when wrestling was mostly a true athletic competition in the United States. But then there was this whole sort of breakaway move movement to sort of like they kind of differentiated the type of wrestling that they were doing in um uh uh like the what would eventually evolve into American professional wrestling and then what kind of got into the Olympics. And the stuff that got into the Olympics was rules were created so people didn't get hurt as much. Right. So, you know, no offense to, you know, you're right, the people that are that compete. You know, at the Olympic level, wrestlers or professional or people that are competing in that style of wrestling you know, around the world. Yes, you need to be fit. You need to be tough. You really need to be able to physically overpower your opponent. Um, but that was all based, even though that gets called Greco-Roman wrestling, that in itself is a type of fake history. Talk about like, you know, fake origin stories for stuff, right? In the European context, you know, in, in the Chinese context, it's like it came from the Shaolin Temple. In the European context, it was the Greeks and the Romans did this, right? That's 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 the European Shaolin Temple right there, right? And so, uh, but this was, and there certainly was wrestling in the Greek and Roman world, and wrestling was actually a very popular sport in that world. But the type of wrestling we call Greco-Roman wrestling was not the type of wrestling that was done by the ancient Greeks, Uh the type of wrestling that is now in the Olympics was developed in the 1870s in France. Um, Actually a little bit earlier. That's a lot. It was developed a little bit like mid 19th 19th century. So mid 1800s in France. And then in the 1870s during the uh, uh, Franco Prussian war, it kind of became one of the main exercise styles used by the French army. And so from there, people that like went and like joined the French army um, kind of disseminated 
that wrestling style. So that style we call Greco-Roman wrestling is really modern French wrestling. Um, and so, you know, so again, you know, not to kind of uh, really contradict your point about, you know, the physical conditioning one needs to have to be a wrestler, but that that form came into being partially because it had rules in place that meant that the wrestlers weren't constantly getting injured, right? Not that you still can't get injured because people do all the time, but it's, it, it used to be worse, right? It used to be, it used to be worse. And so then the other style of wrestling was like, well, where it's going to be, it, it eventually became known as, as catch as catch can wrestling, which was like, basically you could kind of, it was freestyle. You could kind of do whatever you wanted. Then that in the 1920s, when it really kind of shifted into becoming more of a show, there were guys that were like, okay, well, we're going to now take this and and create these moves that are really showy that we can only do if both people cooperate. Right. So like, you know, like the, the body slams, the, like, you know, the suplexes was, you know, was invented by these guys who really wanted to make it into more of a show. But what was fun about that was that learning that like, even in that era, there were still times when like real wrestling would creep in. Right. And that, that to me was like those, I loved that kind of gray area. Like in the 19, by the, by the end of the 1930s, it's all a show. It's all a show. You're not really going to see anything that isn't, hasn't been arranged, hasn't been sort of choreographed, uh, isn't, isn't a type of physical theater. Right. But before that point, it's it's like mostly that, but then there would every now and then there they because they they really were adamant that this is real, the wrestling is real, it's not fake. Don't say that it's rigged, right? So every now and then there would be guys who would come in and be like, okay, well if it's not real, give me a shot at the if it's real, then you got to give me a shot at the title. So every now and then they have these guys who would really come in and be really wrestling, like really trying to pin the other guy, and they would have to like. Either they try and keep these guys out through a bunch of different ways. One of my favorite eras, though, in like the mid 1920s, they would have these wrestlers in the mix they called policemen. And the job of the policemen were to wrestle these guys who really wanted to wrestle. So they would have their champ who they picked themselves, like the promoters picked who the champ was, they picked who the title was. All of the champs, uh, you know, uh, matches were prearranged it was all worked out when they had the title when they dropped the title who they gave it to the storyline that led up to it right kind of the stuff we're familiar with now but there would still be guys in the mix that were like well if this is real then you gotta let me wrestle so they had to have some real wrestlers but they were never the champs they were these like lower level guys who were like secretly the best actual wrestlers because they had to be able to take on these like you know, these little, uh, you know, upstart dudes who wanted a real chance to win. And so they had, to, so you could go to a wrestling match and you might actually see some real wrestling because there were these guys in the mix that were like all kind of keeping them honest in a weird way. Right. But those guys never got to fight the champ. And <laughs> so I love that. So like the, the thing is that the policemen were like secretly the best wrestlers in the 1920s. But wow. those guys were usually these like mean ass bruisers who usually played like heels, like bad guy characters. <laughs> but those guys didn't usually get to wear the belt. You know, yeah. so there you go. Wow. I, I, I love that. It was so fun getting into that stuff. That is that is fascinating. Wow. That is that, yeah. is, that is very, 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 very fascinating. I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's also hilarious because I mean, as, as you know, like RJ has an incredible career of his own, as as you mentioned. Yeah. The first time I had ever seen him was on YTV over oh, yeah. ten years ago on Splat a lot. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, TV no, he's, show. Yo, know, he's an actor. I mean, and that's the thing, but a lot of people don't know he's Canadian. He yeah. kind of talks like he has like a like a like he's from Queens. Like, I don't know how he developed this accent like he he came from New York City, but he's from Markham, Ontario. So I don't know <laughs> what, but he's always talked like that. But again, I, it's not an affectation. I think his his mom or his like his parents must speak like must have that accent because, <laughs> uh, because people are always like boggled when they learn that he's like from uh, from from Canada. 
Um, but, you know, but he's pretty real about it. And again, he was so funny on my show because he's like, man, like, you know, you you want to you want to get humbled, like, you know, do a wrestling show to 25 people in Oshawa, you know? Oh, <laughs> oh talk about I a love tough it. crowd. I love it. But, you know, but he's like, that's paying your dues. And I think there's in that world, there's a lot of that's that's important to uh, people that are, you know, have made their life in wrestling. Like they want you to pay your dues. They want you to go out there and grind. Right. They, you know, they don't like a Johnny come lately. Like they, they, they feel it's, and that's another fascinating thing about that world because like, even though it has been a show for decades, the performers still feel like athletes and still kind of consider themselves athletes and still feel that like, like, for instance, like, even though, of course, you know, there's a storyline that brings us to who's going to be the champion and we're telling a tale here. A lot of the wrestlers feel like you got to earn that through, like, real grinding. They train like that athletes, to me too. Is, that to me is fascinating. Yeah. That to me is fascinating because, like, other, like, actors don't feel like that, mm-hmm. you know, but but wrestlers do. And so I came away like I was it was a great deep dive to do because I'm like, no one believes in wrestling more than the wrestlers. That is kind of bananas to me because I don't know if that's true about magicians, you know? Right, right. I mean, the tra- I mean, wrestlers, I mean, those in, in American wrestling, they train like athletes, too. I mean, yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, and again, I said many times on the show, and I'll say it again here. I have nothing but respect for the, you know, the physicality that goes into it. You do it, you know, it is, it, it's dangerous. You are doing, you are do. It's high, highly athletic stunts are what is being done in the wrestling ring. And so you need to be an athlete to be able to do that, and you need to be in conditioning, and you need to practice that stuff. Uh, like I couldn't get in there and just do it. Uh, and in fact, most wrestlers would be kind of disgusted that anyone thinks that they could try because they know how much work it takes to um, really get yourself in the shape that you need to be and learn how much there is to learn about, because you're doing this with another, but you're doing this kind of dangerous set of stunts with another person to make it really believable, to make it look like you're really fighting you know, or at least like look like you're, you know, to do the, you know, to execute the stunts. Yeah. You know, and again, I'm using the word stunts because like for me, I was like, because wrestlers still are like, they still got to cling to the realness of it. They still don't like to say out loud that it's like, you know, even though we're like post kayfabe, as they say, like we are post the world of like pretending that wrestling is quote unquote real. I learned that the people that do it have a lot of pride in it. And so I also tried, again, there's a, there's another one, like, you know, as much as I'm, there, I was in a way talking about a culture that was not my own when I did that story, right? Normally you're thinking about cultures from different parts of the world or ethnicities that, you know, that, that I am not a part of. No, wrestling is its own tribe, man. And so truly you got to rep- approach it with the same respect that you would with others. But, you know, the part of me that's like, you know, let's, Let's be real. I think this is incredible, wonderful theater. And that's what it is. The wrestlers are still... I mean, RJ is very open about saying like, oh yeah, we're doing theater. He even called it like, I'm doing drag, right? Like he's like, I'm doing performance of gender up there. So this is like a drag show. And I loved that. I was like, oh yeah, this is... Now you're speaking my language. This is great, right? But he, I think, is a um, a rare breed in that world. And that's why he's found a really interesting niche, right? Because he is, I know, he's funny. He's sort of a comic presence. His character, which is really him, you know, now he's evolved where he barely even has a character anymore. He's really just being himself, um, sometimes heightened, but still very much himself. Um, uh, you know, his, his thing is that he takes the piss out of wrestlers, <laughs> <laughs> but he's an insider, right? And he can do that because he's an insider. And uh, I just love him. I love him for it. It's yeah. great. <laughs> it's yeah, a- no, that, that's incredible. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no, that 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 that's fascinating. I mean, 
sports in general also have a similar thing. Like, I mean, each sport has its own culture. I mean, aside from having its own lingo, it also has its own subculture that is that demands a, a certain level of, of respect as well. And as someone who announced sports, I that's something that I have to do as well. Whenever, whether ever I'm, I'm announcing basketball or hockey or soccer, or rugby, swimming, whatever. Like it, it's it's you got it's a all, great announcer yeah. voice. It doesn't Thank surprise you. me that you announce sports. You got that nice baritone. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, we've been through so many topics. I mean, we've we've just been talking about history this whole time. (laughs) We've been wide ranging. I don't think I really told you much about my life story, but that's fine. Yeah, no, that's perfectly (laughs) fine. No, I mean, and, and I'd love to have you back on another episode of of of, of my podcast to you know talk even more about history because uh, it's it, I think there's so many different fascinating conversations that we can have about so many different topics that uh, you know it, it's 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 just great you know it's great to have that. I mean, this is my favorite stuff, and as you can see, you can get me going. It's hard, this is why I needed to have a podcast because like I can't really shut up about this stuff. <laughs> And so it was either just annoy the hell out of my friends or like just put it into a microphone somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so yeah, I mean, so as we start to close this episode of the of the podcast, what is your advice to those who want to go into history education of of some sort? Uh, what is my advice? Uh, well, um, we need good teachers first and foremost. And if someone is passionate about teaching, uh, they should do it. I think, uh, teaching is a very hard job. And, um, I think people sometimes, sometimes pursue teaching because they don't know what else to do. And if that's who you are, you don't do it. (laughs) Find something else because you won't be satisfied in the work. You will find it difficult and frustrating and challenging in ways you weren't prepared for. But if you care about it and you think it's important, then you should do it because we need people in education that actually care about education. Um, and, And the more people in the mix that are there for the right reason, then the better. So I always encourage people to do that, but you have to be driven to do it. Um, I, I I feel like it's the same when people like are like weighing whether or not they should have children. <laughs> and I don't think anyone should have children unless they are really driven to do it deep down. You have to have the thing in you because once you have a child, it will challenge you in ways that, you know, nothing can prepare you for, right? You know, that doesn't matter how many books you read or movies you watch, like you just can't fully prepare for it. And I, I, you know, parenting and teaching are different, but I do actually think they're the same in that you should only do it if you are driven to do it. Now, if you are driven to do it, in both cases, it will be the most rewarding thing you can possibly do. I I true when a, a good day of teaching is a day that you like laugh out loud a lot and you truly feel like you gave more to the world than you took away from. So but but those those don't that's not every day. <laughs> you know. So, you know, if if you are considering education, truly ask yourself do are you passionate about it and then and then so then if you're interested in being specifically a history teacher the way i always had to challenge myself is how do we teach history in a way that isn't just me talking to a group of seated kids because with history a lot of what you have to do is like get them to know understand the story Right. So there is a lot. I mean, you know, I'm a storyteller. I told a lot of stories in class. I was a real talker as a teacher, but I had to constantly challenge myself not to do that, not to fall back on that, because at the level that I was teaching, a high school level, that's not necessarily a good style of teaching for high school kids. So, you know, you have to be constantly trying to 
think about ways to engage them and get them not just to hear history, but to actually do history. And here's what I mean by that. It's the work of historians, but, you know, uh, simmered down to what's, uh, you know, uh, graspable for a high school student age and stage appropriate, as we say. Right. So, you know, that means getting them to weigh sources, look at sources, trying to understand what what should we trust, what should we not trust? How can we balance this together? But then also, like, I like to use a ton of role play. Uh, uh, I don't know if anyone out there, I'm sure some people listening may have done Model UN, but the Model UN has these great um, uh, m- modules you can run if you go and kind of find the Model UN uh, you know, materials out there that are set in historical moments of crisis. So they, there's the UN crisis committee, but they'll sometimes use that uh, style of uh, like model UN part- participant thing, but they'll set it in a historical moment. So you can do, I, I did one with like the, I, during the French revolution and we're in the committee of public safety with, you know, Robespierre and, uh, and Danton and like all these you know, notables from the revolution and you're debating whether you're, whether or not you're going to execute the King. Right. Uh, those are the best moments, right? Now, of course, again, those things take, things take setup, but you have to challenge yourself to try and do that stuff, to try and get them doing it more than just hearing it. Cause the, one of the hard lessons I learned is that it doesn't matter how good a history storyteller you are some people just don't learn that way and uh and so you know i i really had to kind of push myself and sometimes i was more successful than others sometimes i'm like you know what today i'm just i'm i'm telling these kids the tale and then i'm going to get them to do some reading right um but but just because you're a talker and you're someone that likes history doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be the best history teacher. The really good teachers, the real one of the people that I admired and I looked up to, were the people that were constantly sort of changing their classes, constantly creating lessons that got the kids doing things, got the kids talking, got the kids working with each other, got the kids creating something. That's the good stuff. And, uh, you know, I, it it took me a little while to learn that I didn't, I don't think I was necessarily like, I I certainly didn't show up, uh, on the scene. Like I got this. And I thought that because I'm again, because I'm a talker, I thought like, this is, this is what this is, right? That's not what it is. And so, I don't know. That's another piece of advice that I have specifically for history educators is push yourself to get the kids to do history, not just hear it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And those are wise words of advice because one of my favorite teachers in my high school years and really any part of my student years as well was my history teacher because Mm -hmm. he at the time was able to explain history in a way that really mattered. And he was so enthusiastic about it and you felt it. You really did feel it. So yeah, absolutely important and great pieces of advice for our audience there well sebastian thank you so so very much for coming on to the podcast and i mean i you're welcome to you're welcome to come back again because <laughs> there's so many things that we can still talk about about history because we only scratched the iceberg here you know the tip of the iceberg here <laughs> yeah i know it was fun and i know i i rambled i but i was uh hey we're podcasting here man you gotta you gotta go down the rabbit hole that's how it works right exactly exactly yeah I and mean, that's against <laughs> Thanks again, Sebastian. And thank you to our audience for tuning into This is the Legend of. You've just heard or viewed the living legend of Sebastian Major, podcaster, creator, and podcaster of Our Fake History. You can follow his podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Our Fake History. Once again, that's at Our Fake History. Be sure to follow his podcast and learn some fascinating facts about history that you may not have actually learned about in your schooling. Once again, thank you very much for tuning into this episode. And also visit us on our website, www.thisisthelegendof. You can follow us on Instagram and on LinkedIn. 
as well as Facebook once that page gets gets set up. I haven't decided whether or not I want to set that up yet, but uh, for sure, follow us on our social media. Support us on our website as well. If you want to donate, by all means, donate to us as well. Thank you so very much. Signing off for now, this is Amos Vang. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay legendary. <laughs>